Let's go to God in word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time we have to come together and study your word again. Father, what a wonderful blessing to start out the day this way and to see what your word has to say to us. Father, please help us not to just be uh, people who look and see, but people who, after they look and see, make application of their own lives. Help us, Father, to grow in your wisdom. We appreciate your word that's given to us that we may do exactly that. We want to be closer and closer to what you will have us to be, Father. Help us always to strive towards that goal. Father, uh, please be with us in our study today. Help us to see what your word is saying and not try to make it say what we want it to say. Help us never to have that attitude, Father, towards your word. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Okay, as I said, we're in Psalm 32. This is a wonderful psalm of, uh, of uh, well, my, my Bible has a title over it, which I think is pretty good. The Blessedness of Forgiveness and of Trust in God. We're going to see a couple of different uh, thoughts in that regard. Um, let's read Let's read the psalm and then go over it piece by piece. It's only a... Uh, it's it's only an eleven verse psalm. We've cut we've tackled a lot more verses than that, haven't we? At times, so let's read this. How blessed is he who whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groanings all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in, time, in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle, to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near you. <clears throat> Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Okay, let's go back let's go back to verse one now. Notice what we see here. We see in verses one and two two additional beatitudes. Uh, I, I point that out. We oftentimes call the first twelve verses of Matthew chapter five as containing the beatitudes in the Bible. But uh, understand something. These are beatitudes as well. Um, th these are directing, remember what that idea of a beatitude is. It, uh, basically, in, in Matthew, we see blessings are being shown for a correct attitude towards God. All right? it's, it's a blessing to have this attitude. For instance, the poor in spirit, for, they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right? Well, look at what these are saying about what our attitude should be. Blessed, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven? whose sin is covered. Let's cover that one first. That's an obvious one that I, I can't imagine anyone not seeing a blessing in, at least anyone who is concerned about their sin. You know, God's word is given to us to teach us God's way. For the individual who is not following God's way, God's word has certain things in it that points to them about their need to. 
about the problem that sin has caused for them in their lives, about the problem that sin will cause them on Judgment Day. And so one who has the right attitude towards God's Word, who recognizes their need for God for the ultimate problem, and that is the sin in our lives, that individual, the right attitude, he's going to realize it's a blessing that my sins have been covered. All right. Now look at the second one. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And this is basically saying the same idea, um, uh, but he's going to he's going to finish it with a with a statement at the end of verse two that I want to comment on greatly. But notice how he says that the Lord does not impute iniquity. I, lo I love that wording because where was that iniquity imputed? Where did it get imputed? In the garden. Uh, well, okay, I see what you're saying. How did it get imputed to man? For Adam and Eve, well, most certainly it got it got imputed to them in the garden. And for each one of us, when we when we committed our sins, it that those sins were imputed on us until when? Yeah. Well, yeah, but until Jesus Christ paid for it on the cross. Okay, once Jesus Christ paid for it on the cross, where are those sins imputed? Where were those sins imputed? On him. Okay, they were they were put on Jesus. God God saw that sin on Jesus Christ. But it, there, those sins are no longer imputed on the man or woman who has been forgiven. Okay, this is a beautiful this is a beautiful statement about not only that the sins have been forgiven, but where those sins went and where they were imputed was not not on the individual who did them, but instead on God, Jesus in the Jesus in the form uh, as man, but God he is uh, on the cross. God took those sins. He imputed it upon himself. Okay. Um, Albert. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, that, that word blessed, of course, means happy, a time of rejoicing, a time to be happy. That's and right. <clears throat> knowing that your sins are forgiven, like the Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip baptized him, he went on his way rejoicing, and the Philippian jailer rejoiced with all his house. And so the, it's, it's a time of rejoicing, of, of really understanding that you're no longer charged with what you did. Amen. It's been gone. It's gone and forever forgotten. Amen. Amen. Yeah, just like each one of those Beatitudes. It's ha happy is the one who's poor in spirit, for his is the kingdom of God. Yeah, that idea of being happy. It's a blessing. And and, and I've heard it said before, and I like it. The, in the context, the happiness comes because you know you are approved of by God. Okay? Right. God approves of you. Yes. Yes. Uh, Denny just came on. You might let him know where we are. Ah, hi, Denny. We are in. We're in uh, Psalm verse th Psalm thirty-two. Uh, we just finished, or we're in the midst of verse two, Psalm thirty-two, two. Okay. Okay. Exact. Exactly, Bob. <laughs> yep, you know it. Okay. Now look at that last phrase in verse two, and in whose spirit. There is no deceit. Now, building off of what was the beginning of that verse, how blessed is the one whose spirit, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, we understand, of course, the idea of, of lying to others and how God feels about lying. But I'm wondering, in fact, it looks like in the context, the deceit he's talking about here is not just the way he tries to fool other people. Or actually, I guess it does include the idea. Morning, morning, Chris. We're in we're in Psalm thirty-two. Psalm thirty-two. We're in we're in verse the end of verse two. But in whose spirit there is no deceit. Okay. Um, he he he's yeah. He, the individual. Think of it this way, because you'll see why I'm, I'm saying that with verse three. Think of the individual who is a hypocrite. He's showing the world what he wants the world to see. But what he actually is on the inside is different. Shows himself to be something different than who he is. Um, look at verse 3 now. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. 
through my groanings all day long. So he's talking about keeping his sin to himself. Now, he, he's lying to those around him, looking at him. But who, you know who else he's lying to? He's lying to himself. He's lying to himself that he's okay as far as God is concerned. He's lying to himself that, that he can get away with this when he himself knows exactly what kind of individual he is. <clears throat> so because of that sin that he was keeping to himself, his body was wasted away through his groanings all day long. Um, the, next, the next part of verse 4, I want to comment on that. I want to say that. Well, all of verse 4 with that. For day, by, day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. So because of, because of the sin and knowing he has the sin and needs to make the sin right, he can feel in his own mind the separation that he actually has with God if he's going to be honest with himself. Now, it, Albert, yes, ma'am. Uh, Linda comments, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Okay. Let's see what that says on that. 2 Corinthians 5.21. All right. Um. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yeah, there's that idea of imputing the sin upon Jesus that we talked about in, in verses 1 and 2. What's that? I'm sorry. It's on the screen for those of you on Zoom. Oh, yeah. For those on Zoom, it's on the screen. 521. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that, that, that deals with the idea that, that the sin is not imputed on us but it's, it was imputed on Jesus Christ. Now, let's get back to that idea of, of wasting away over the guilt, the re recognition of the sin. That is something that will happen to the individual who is honest with himself. Once he recognizes the one, who, the one whose conscience is bothering him. But in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, we find out there's a time when the conscience will be seared. This is, a, this is a very important point in a person's life. When we have sin that we know about in our own lives and we have a choice to make, we either stay in the sin, stay in the sin going this way, or we leave the sin going this way. That, that's the crossroad in our lives. We, can, we admit the sin. We recognize the sin for what it is as opposed to leaving the sin. When we get to those cross, that crossroad, coming down to that crossroad, we've got a decision to make. What, what's it going to be? Now, at that point, the individual is feeling the weight of their own sin, feeling the responsibility, the recognition that if I don't take care of this, I'm lost. Sadly, some people work their way past that problem. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul describes them as people whose conscience has been seared like with a hot iron. What, what that means is, you know, have you ever, have you ever burnt yourself so bad that uh, hopefully not permanently, but at least for a while, that was, that, that, that spot had no feeling, you know, once the pain was gone. You know, for, fortunately, there's there's times when you're gonna have your nerves kind of kind of grow back or come back after that. Maybe they're just damaged, but they come back. But some people get burnt. A, a, a bad burn can actually cause you to be to not have feeling in that part of your body ever again. Well, that's the same idea he's talking about when we let our consciences burn like that. When we allow them to to be numbed to the fact of that sin. This is talking about the person before that. <coughs> the Dave, idea, David, go, the idea of being second. calloused over. Yes, exactly. That's like, right, Bob. Like your hands when you work mm -hmm. real hard and it's labor, and when you begin that and they're not calloused, it hurts. Yeah. But after, after you've kept working for a while, you do the same thing, but there's no hurt. And one conscience can be calloused over to the point that it makes no difference to them anymore. 
Exactly, exactly. David is writing this psalm, and he's a man after God's own heart. So like, like Bob is just pointing out there, you know, you, you can keep at it, and eventually you're not going to care anymore about any, because you're not going to have any pain when your hands get calloused. Well, when your heart gets calloused, you can keep at what you're doing, and eventually you won't get to the point that you have any pain. It doesn't bother you anymore. David's not at that point. David, a man after God's own heart, it bothered him. The sin wore on him. He describes it as his body wasting away. He was groaning all, all day long. Um, the, the, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. God, God's word, what, God, what he knew that God's word says weighed upon him. What God's, what God's opinion about what he was doing weighed upon him. And his vitality drained away as with a with a fever heat of summer, you know, just like the just like the heat of the day can wear you down and make you make you tired. That's what he's talking about. So what does he do? The one who takes remember what I said. You come to a crossroad. You come down to that crossroad. You can go this way towards keep doing it, or you can go this way to do something about it to make it right. So what does he do? Verse five. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity, I did not hide. He went from being someone in verse 3, he kept silent and hid his sin. He, 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 of course, can't hide it from God, but he was doing it. He was trying to. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity, I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, you can connect that with 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we are faithful, to, if, we are, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. All right? For the one who's a follower of God, the one who is already part of his family, we just need to come to him and confess our sins. And God is faithful and just to forgive us. So, so David, is, David is acknowledging the, the, righteous, the righteousness of God and the forgiveness of God in that statement, okay? Again, we got to be careful. We, we each are born with a conscience, just like we are each born with a right hand. Well, how, how well you treat that hand, how well you protect that hand from danger, you know, you're going to keep that right hand. Uh, but if you're not careful, you could lose it. Same thing with a conscience. As, you know, we get, we're born with a conscience. How you, how you treat that conscience how you how you uh, protect that conscience is up to you, and it's something that is can be helpful to us when it's trained in godly values, and it can help us to overcome sin. God gave it to us for that towards that purpose. But if we if we mistreat it, it can get seared just as if you burned your right hand and not have any feeling. Okay, now look at what it, now now David wants to proclaim. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray, pray to you. He's speaking to God. Let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will, they, they will not reach him. Now, it's interesting to see the pronoun they is going back to the waters. Okay? Do you remember... You remember that what the Bible says about the floodwaters of Noah's day. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. During the building of the ark, <clears throat> he's described as a preacher of righteousness in, in, um, in, the, in the New Testament. During the building of the ark, there are plenty of people. And by the way, I don't think that was just during the building of the ark. I think Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was someone who was trying to get people to do the right thing probably his whole life. It doesn't say after the ark was being built, he was a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness. People should have listened to him. When in the end, only Noah and his family were saved on the ark. But the rest, look at the second half of verse 6. The rest had a flood of great waters that did reach them. But the one who prays to God, who comes to God when God may be found, the, the they are protected from the flood of great waters. He's using an illustration about us and our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> when 
is the time that God will not be able to be found to receive forgiveness of sins. When's that time? Till we die. Yeah, once we die, or once Jesus Christ comes again. That's God can be found all the way up until then. He is saying there comes a time when you can't call out to God. Now, for some people, if they burn their consciences, there comes a time when they won't cry out to God. But this is talking about while God can be found. He can be found your entire life. Before you take your last breath, God can be found. But there comes a time, and he's given a warning. That's how it was in Noah's day. There came a time when those people on earth, they probably were calling out to God. Once the rain started coming, the flood started coming up, and they couldn't get in the boat. They probably were crying out to God. Too late. Judgment day had come, and they were outside the ark. Same thing here for us. So it says in verse... Yes, I'm sorry, Bob. That's all right. Uh, we're reading Isaiah 55, 6, call upon the Lord while he may be found. Uh, seek him while he is near. And so we, we understand that there's a time coming whenever either due to the hardness of our heart or the end of life that we, that we no longer have that, uh, that privilege of calling on him, that mm -hmm. he's near. Either be, he, while, we're, while yeah. we're living, he's ready. Yeah. And I, I read of a, of a man called Leopold, and I, I know very little of him, but he has he has turned this verse into uh, substantiation that faith is all that is necessary. Yeah. And so forgiveness only to the righteous. And so he's used that as uh, as faith only. But in Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one can see God. Yeah. And so the, the verses, the Bible is always its best uh, interpreter. And if you just keep reading, it'll settle the, the issue. Yeah. And apparently he didn't read far enough. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. So, so, so look at what we see next in verse 7. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. This is a recognition of where one needs to go for their sin. You go, you go to God with your sin. The floodwaters will not be able to reach you. You know, the judgment, judgment will not be able to reach you because your sins have been forgiven. And you, you, because you have your hiding place in God. And recognizing, just total recognition, it's what God is doing that is saving me. I am, uh, I trust in God to save me. Now, people question who is speaking in verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> Many people believe, and, and I do too, this is now God speaking back. All right. God is saying what he will do. God is saying how he will do. Uh, and, and I believe that's a good way for you are my hiding place. You are. Well, that, now God speaks back and says, I will. In fact, look how verse seven ends. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Well, now God is going to speak here and say what those songs are saying. Here's my deliverance. Okay. Um, look at what he says in verse eight. Now, if this is David speaking about, uh, and by the way, here's what, here's one of the reasons I don't think it's David. Some people think this might be David speaking to others now that he has in, now that he has learned this truth about God, he's going to tell other people this truth. I, I like, I like the idea, but what bothers me is, is how verse eight ends. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. All right. Um, David is not capable of having his eyes on everyone in the world. And, and this psalm is for anyone who, who wants to be godly. All right. But God certainly is. So that's one of the reasons I believe this is speaking about God. Um, so, so look at what I believe God has to say to us, speaking to David, but also to us. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. 
I will counsel you with my eye upon you. All right, God, God's promise, once we make the commitment to be God's servant, to, to, to find his will, God's promise to us is, I will instruct you in my will. All right, he's given us his word so that we can learn his will. God, God doesn't leave us without any hope. we got to just guess and hope we get it right as far as God is concerned. No, he's given us his word. He promises us he will help us learn his word. Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. God, God is going to help us down that road. So he instructs us and teaches us the way we should go. He counsels us with, with his eye upon us. Now think about that for a second. If you have someone who is your your uh, your help, your uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Someone who is trying to instruct you, an instructor, for instance. Let's I'll use Air Force terminology. I'm not thinking of the right word. I'm wanting. Oh, um, almost had it. Oh well. Um, if you have an instructor who's who's looking and watching you, he's going to counsel you with his eye upon you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Pat knows what I'm talking about. You've had instructors like that before who told you how to do something in the Air Force. They got their eye upon right. you. Yeah. They're going to tell you, when don't do that. Or maybe they're going to let you do it and laugh at you. You know, maybe that's how some instructors in, in the Air you Force learned work. the hard way. Yeah, you learned the hard way, yes. You know, but, uh, um, you know, that idea of being to a tutor or an instructor showing you uh, the way. God says, I will. God, God, and if you go all the way back up into verse four, night and day, your hand was heavy upon me. God was, God was pushing uh, David through his teachings, through the word, through what David knew about God, through what David knew God expected of him. God was pressuring him to do the right thing. Same thing there, I believe, in verse eight. Um, God ought to be our mentor. Mentor. I think that's the word I was looking for. Mentor. Or, I think that's the word. Yeah, I think that is. I think that's the word I was trying to think of a little bit ago. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Now, he says what not to be like. And by the way, too often within God's kingdom, people are like this next one. They do it only because they are, they are made to do it. Look at what he says. Do not be as the horse or the mule who have no understanding whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check, okay? Don't be like them who, who are being forced to do something. Once you take the, once you take, especially a mule, I love that idea of a mule. Once you take that bridle off, he's going to do whatever he wants to. If he thinks he can get away with it, even with the bridle on, he's going to do whatever he wants to. But if you, if you have the right, if you ever have the right technique, if you do it correctly, you're going to finally get that mule to do what you want him to do. All right. Well, God's saying, don't be like that. Don't do it just because you're being forced to do it. Uh, you know, no. Um, uh, do not be as the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. God doesn't want that kind of person. He wants that kind of person who grows to the point of be, of doing it because it's the right thing to do, because it's Ten what minutes. they know God wants them to do. Ten minutes? Okay, we're yes. good. Thank you. Thank you. Albert? Yes. Another, another thought here, too, may be uh, in mentioning these animals. They can be very contrary and stubborn and unwilling to do what they need to do according to their instructor, but... Uh, uh, that would be likened to a man with great pride and unwilling to admit his differences that he has. But we're told that pride goeth before a fall. So we can't be prideful in, in trying to use, let God guide us. We have to bend according to his will. Amen. Amen. And, we, and, and, and the point is, we have to bend according to his will. We have to be willing to um, desiring to do his will. As we grow closer and closer to knowledge of what is right and wrong, the one with the, with the heart of, you know, with a man after God's own heart like David, 
is going to recognize I want to do the right thing. Not I have to be forced to do the right thing. Okay? Too often, we don't grow to that point. As as uh, as babes in Christ, just like, like a little baby, sometimes has to be made to do the right thing. Well, your, your desire is, is that baby grows up, that child grows up to the point that he does the right thing because it's the right thing. Okay? God doesn't want someone who has to be forced forever. God wants plus, someone who does it. Yes? Plus, man is born with that ability to choose right or left. Amen. With a horse or a mule, the mule's just going along saying, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and man has that ability to change his attitude towards uh, not doing, a very good point, to not doing his choice, uh, but choosing to do God's choice. Very, very good point. Very good point, Pat. Look that at goes, that Go goes to the illustration also of a, of a wild, strong stallion that when it's tamed, when it's trained, it still has the same power, but it yields that power to the will of the master. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Look at verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Now, quite frankly, we all have sorrows in this world. Notice what it's saying. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Well, many are the sorrows of the righteous, okay? Yeah, but the righteous, the one who trusts in God, God's loving kindness surrounds him. No. I don't think, and sometimes, understand something. Sometimes the sorrows of the wicked are of their own doing, okay? They, they make some kind of bad choice, and they have to live with it. You know, righteous people oftentimes have the same thing. They make a bad choice, and they have to live with it. But God's loving kindness is upon the individual who, is, who trusts in him. We and, and the trusting in God keeps us from going down that wrong road that causes us to do something that we regret doing in the future. So, so uh, this idea here is not taken away from the fact that righteous people do have sorrows, but that wicked people do not have God. Okay? And perhaps for that reason have more sorrows. a strong contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. Amen. Amen. Finally, verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. This verse, this psalm, finishes like it began. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. And shout for joy, all, all you who are upright in heart. Why? Because you have been forgiven. Because you are, you, uh, God does not impute iniquity upon you. Because you are not fooling yourself in thinking that you're okay. Okay, see, see that? I love that psalm for that reason. It most certainly is a psalm that speaks of the blessedness of forgiveness and the blessedness of trusting in God. Okay. Any other comments on Psalm 32? When we were when we were discussing in verse six, um, and I mentioned Isaiah 55, 6, that uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, today is the day of salvation. Yeah. And so those who wait until it's too late. He's saying, don't wait. Today is the day. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm getting down on the on my list of psalms that I've been I've been I've had requested, including one that I added. I've got five psalms left. Uh no, 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 no. We just did 32. No, I've got four psalms left. Okay. Yeah, four psalms left. So if you have a favorite psalm, um, Next week, or not next week, tomorrow, we're going to do Psalm 39. If you want to mark that, Psalm 39. But uh, if you have any other Psalms that you like, let me give, by the way, let me tell you the list of what I, I plan on doing. 39 tomorrow, 
49, 103, and, oh, no, we did 103. No, take that one out. Wow, we've only got three Psalms left. We did 103. All right, so 39, 49. 49? Yeah, 39, then 49, then 148. Um, doesn't have to be in that order, but uh, um, except for 39, I'm doing it tomorrow. <laughs> but um, if you have any other Psalms, we're, we're just about done. And, and that, that could be good, too. It could be good to go to another another uh, place in the Bible or something else, you know, something well, else in the Bible. 36 is a really good one. You like 36? Speaking of the loving kindness of God. Right, right. Are you wanting 36 done? Is that what you're At saying? At some point, but not yeah. necessarily in a no yeah. word like you say. Yeah, okay. I'll throw 36 in there. Um. You all let me know if there's any others. And for that matter, since we're getting close to the end of the Psalms, you all let me know where you might want to go from here. Okay? Let's go to God in a word of prayer and we'll be closed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Father, we do trust in you. Help us, Father, to allow that trust to never be damaged. To allow ourselves, Father, to feel the conscience you gave us once it's been rightly rightly trained by your word help us to feel that conscience you've given us pushing us to do the right thing to never neglect it father but to allow ourselves to follow your way with a correctly trained conscience knowing father that that is just one tool you've given us on this earth to make it home to you in eternity help us always father to trust your word and if, if necessary, to adjust our consciences towards what your word is saying. Uh, Father, please, please be with us throughout this day. Help us to be a light to those that are around us. We can help others to know your will, Father, in two different ways. We understand that. We can tell them about it, and we can live it in front of them. Help us, Father, to be your word by the way we act. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen.